and a little bit of hope. But I, you know, I've got to say, I'm still reluctant. I'm still hesitant. I'm still skeptical. Now at 11, the latest on Oregon's unemployment benefit situation and the hope to finally clear out the backlog. Plus, you know, we don't forget. We don't give up. Ten years after his disappearance, Kyron Horman's parents keep the faith that after a decade of mystery and sorrow, they can still find answers. And nationwide protests, including in Portland, over the death of George Floyd. This is KGW News at 11. Thanks for joining us for KGW News at 11. I'm Laurel Porter. It has been a slow and deliberate path to reopen, but now we have two down, one to go. Today, Governor Brown approved Washington County to enter phase one of reopening. It is the second of the three metro area counties to do so. The county will enter phase one on Monday, June 1st. Phase one means certain restrictions will ease. Bars and restaurants can offer sit down service with social distancing and group size limits. Barbers, salons and gyms can also start to reopen. We're talking Washington County now. In person gatherings are also limited to 25 people. However, officials say this doesn't mean it's time for us to all let our guard down. I'm calling on our entire community to continue these outstanding work that we've all been doing to keep COVID-19 from spreading. It is so important to understand that entering phase one will not be a return to normal and that each of us has a responsibility to get this right. As for the other two metro area counties, Clackamas has already entered phase one. Multnomah plans to apply on June 5th with the goal of entering phase one on June 12th. Now to a major development in how the state shares information about COVID-19 outbreaks. Late tonight, the Oregon Health Authority announced a change in policy. It will start reporting large COVID-19 outbreaks in workplaces. Now this comes after criticism over the state's lack of transparency in several cases, including a major outbreak just this week. It happened at Townsend Farms locations in Multnomah and Washington counties. Catherine Cook gets us up to speed. A hot afternoon on the grounds of Townsend Farms in Cornelius as seasonal workers head to temporary housing. On Thursday, state health officials confirmed that 48 seasonal workers with the fruit processing plant tested positive for COVID-19. Those workers arrived with a group of 350 people last weekend and are divided between the Cornelius site in Washington County and the Fairview plant in East Multnomah County. The state believes they contracted the virus before arriving in Oregon. When I learned that there were more positive cases, I was just sort of terrified. I'm like, oh my goodness. Dr. Laura Byerly is medical director at Virginia Garcia Memorial Health Center, which serves migrant farm workers in Washington and Yamhill counties. Team members regularly check on migrant camps to see if they're following regulations. They're also helping screen workers for COVID-19. She believes this is just another example of how quickly the virus spreads. Any group of people that are ha traveling together and living in tight quarters, it's not Townsend Farm, it's not, it's not people from Mexico, it is, this is how the virus transmits. So you, you put rich people on a cruise ship and they spread it. Initially, the Oregon Health Authority would not disclose where the 48 person outbreak was centered. Health officials explained, they rarely reveal an outbreak at any specific company to protect company and patient privacy. But late Thursday, the OHA announced a change in policy. They will start reporting large COVID-19 outbreaks in workplaces. That would include any outbreak involving five or more people. A spokesperson with Oregon's Occupational Safety and Health Administration tells KGW that OSHA is evaluating multiple complaints filed against towns and farms. Public records show the complaints allege poor sanitation, a lack of social distancing, and people working seven days a week while sick. This is Townsend's second COVID-19 outbreak, state health officials just confirmed. The first, in late April, involved 53 of the company's year-round employees. It also went unpublicized by state health officials. 
On Thursday, Washington County officials addressed the Townsend outbreak, which they said would not impede the county's approval to enter phase one reopening on Monday. We are concerned about um, stigma, stigma being placed on these workers. Um, that's why we think it's really important to, to help everyone to understand that they are really some of the heroes in this COVID-19 um, epidemic um, because they have had to continue to work. State and county agencies are working with Townsend to improve safety and sanitation measures for its workers, emphasizing physical distancing and wearing personal protective equipment. This week, members of the Oregon Army National Guard, Department of Agriculture, and Oregon State University Extension Program began delivering 900,000 face coverings for agricultural workers across the state. And as workers tend to the harvest, Dr. Byerly says she and her team will tend to their health. We'll keep visiting. We're going to go out to the same camp weekly, so we'll have a chance to offer more tests, repeat tests. Catherine Cook, KGW News. 20% of Oregon's workforce has filed for unemployment benefits. That's according to new data released by the state employment department today. The accommodation and food services industries have been hit the hardest. We keep hearing from so many of you frustrated and running out of options trying to get your benefits. We found out nearly half of traditional unemployment claims filed still haven't been paid out and tens of thousands are backlogged. Many, especially gig workers, haven't heard from the employment department other than denial letters. Yesterday, employment department leaders presented a plan to lawmakers to get claims out of the logjam and improve service. So that gives me a little bit of light and a little bit of hope. But I, you know, I've got to say I'm still reluctant. I'm still hesitant. I'm still skeptical. You know, it's, it's a broken system. We're a family of five getting by on very little. Those stats we just shared do not include pandemic unemployment assistance claims for self-employed workers. So we don't yet know the true number of Oregonians who've been waiting months for money. Developing tonight, it is chaos on the streets of Minneapolis. Protesters are furious over the death of George Floyd, the man who died in police custody. Demonstrators stormed a police station tonight and started setting fires. Officers appeared to have abandoned it by that point. The Minnesota National Guard has been activated. Protesters have also damaged and looted stores, while still others marched peacefully in the streets. Protests were held nationwide over the death, including in Portland. This group gathered in front of the Justice Center in downtown Portland for several hours tonight. This comes after shocking video appeared to show an officer with his knee on Floyd's neck while Floyd told the officers he couldn't breathe. He later died at the hospital. The officers were fired, but protesters say they should be charged with murder. Investigators are urging patience. Portland police responded to the situation, saying in a statement, the actions and tactics displayed on the video do not represent our profession's values and are contrary to our fundamental duty to protect and serve. We wanted to talk to Police Chief Jamie Rush today, Rush today about but we were told she's on mandatory furlough. This as the city tries to save money during the pandemic. Instead, we heard from the acting chief, Chris Davis. We just need to be real about the fact that in our profession, we have a problem in our relationship uh, with communities, particularly marginalized communities and communities of color. Um, we have, we've spent a lot of time and expended a lot of effort in this organization and in this city to move our organization and our profession beyond that. Uh, but we recognize, and, and an incident like this just underscores the responsibility that we have to continue that work. Chief Davis says the police bureau is aware of protests in Portland over Floyd's death. He says they will try to avoid being involved unless it's necessary. A week from today marks a sad anniversary. 10 years since the disappearance of Kyron Horman. The young boy vanished after being dropped off at Skyline School and hasn't been seen since. Our Kylie Boshi has reported on this extensively and recently talked to Kyron's parents about how they hope all this time could actually help them finally find some answers.
At a time when the world is eager to return to normalcy by going back to school or work, the mother of a missing Portland boy admits normal is something she hasn't felt in almost 10 years. Normal went away on June 4th, and every day we adjust. We try to survive. Desiree Young's little boy, Kyron Horman, disappeared from Skyline School in Northwest Portland on June 4, 2010. So there's his picture. Prompting the largest search effort in Oregon history. But Kyron Horman has never been found. That night, I never thought in a million years we will be here in 10 years. Never. It's sad and it's disappointing and frustrating. Kyron's father, Kane Horman, still has photos of the missing seven-year-old like these hanging throughout his home. You know, we don't forget, we don't give up. Uh, we talk about him, we still celebrate birthdays and, you know, do stuff for him at holidays and all that kind of stuff. So, Kyron's wow. parents wow. remain hopeful yeah. the case yeah. will be yeah. solved. Yeah. And the missing yeah. boy's yeah. mother yeah. believes yeah. at least one person can provide answers. Terry Horman. Terry, how can you stay silent? Kyron's stepmother has long been the focus of investigators, although she's never been charged. And just tell us, no matter how bad it is, just tell us and end this roller coaster that we're on every single day. A new book titled Boy Missing, The Search for Kyron Horman, details the circumstantial evidence surrounding Terry Horman, including claims that several witnesses saw Kyron leave the school with Terry Horman on June 4th, 2010. Literally one of the adults said they weren't holding hands walking out together, but they left the school together. Author so Rebecca that's... Morris wrote, Terry acted suspicious and washed Kyron's dirty laundry and his backpack and jacket the day he disappeared. Previously, Terry has admitted failing lie detector tests and family members claim, unlike others, Terry had a difficult time piecing together her whereabouts on June 4th. Terry has denied any involvement in Kyron's disappearance. As the allegations turn dark, Desiree Young admits it's changed her perspective. I always want for Kyron to be able to come home. I know that 10 years later, that's slimmer and slimmer as an option. But I know too that it happens for mothers. It happens, their kids get to come home. So I still am gonna hold on to that. Even though I know the reality of our situation and where we're at today. The boy's father, Kane Horman, maintains Kyron is still out there, waiting to be found. I think he was taken from school. I don't think he's been in the area. I think he's out of the area somewhere. I think he's with somebody else. Um, and I, I, I still will, will repeat that we don't have enough information to really tell us, you know, whether he's alive or not. And there's really nothing conclusive in either direction. So we continue to believe that he's out there. This case started as a search for a little boy. A decade later, Kyron would be approaching his 18th birthday. And sadly, he's still missing. Boy, it is heartbreakingly painful. That was Kylie Boshi reporting. Multnomah County investigators haven't confirmed any of the allegations in the book. They say the investigation is active and ongoing. We have a lot more in-depth reporting on this ongoing story. You can find it on KGW.com and our social media channels.